This is chapter 5 of Cornelius or Castoriadis and Critical Theory by Christos Memos. The chapter is titled The Crisis of Modern Societies and the Revival of Emancipatory Politics. Castoriadis' critique of totalitarianism, Marxism, and Marx occupies a large part of his political thinking and critical project. His critique was not always balanced and sufficiently clarified in terms of his political intentions and the perspective from which it was launched, yet this limitation should not overshadow his parallel critical effort to analyze and explicate the crisis of modern capitalist societies. Although uneven and disproportionate in respect to his critique of the crisis of Marxism in, and the left, broadly conceived, Castoriadis' views concerning the crisis and decay of contemporary societies are of extreme importance and interest. This chapter starts with Castoriadis' analysis of and stands towards the Re revolutionary crisis of May 1968. His pioneering and radical approach not only elucidates the events, but also supplies us with insightful remarks that could lead to a better understanding of contemporary social movements and uprisings. Castoriadis' interpretation of the May events constitutes a crucial link in order to engage critically in a thoughtful attempt to understand the crisis of modern societies. The chapter goes on to read the phenomenon of the recurring capitalist crises through Castoriadis' twofold approach. First, and critically, first, it critically explores his theory of crisis, which is grounded in the contradictory constitution and antagonistic movement of capitalist social relations. The concept of reification and the dynamic of class struggle play a pivotal role in his conceptualization of crisis as ensuing from the inherent contradictions of capitalist social production. Second, the chapter goes on to outline critically Castoriadis' second interpretation of the issue of crisis, which pertains to the adventure of the project of autonomy, both its own emergence and eclipse. It proceeds to consider his fusion of the two previous analytical approaches which led him to perceive modern societies as moving from a state of permanent crisis to a situation of decline and decomposition. In doing so, it follows Castoriadis' view on the crisis that the identification process, the expanded, quote, vacuum industry, end quote, and the rising tide of insignificancy, which, in line with the disappearance of capitalist social significations that held society together and the evanescence of non-economic values, make neoliberal societies dysfunctional, unable to reproduce themselves smoothly and overcome the crisis. Through this prism, then, the current crisis is seen as a moment of opportunity and decision which involves the necessity to act in the direction of constructing a radical alternative. Finally, the chapter seeks to trace Castoriadis' radical alternative to crisis by critically examining and further elaborating his positions with respect to socialism, autonomy, and revolution. In this regard, the accelerated mental and moral poverty of contemporary human beings as the inside limit of the crisis of capitalist societies and ecological catastrophe as an outside limit necessitate a radical re resolution of the crisis. They require a commitment to the revolutionary project, which entails the autonomous self-transformation of society and the struggle for collective self-activity and self-institution. Section 1. Castoriadis and the Crisis of May 1968 Evolutionary conceptions of history and mechanistic versions of social development espouse a philosophy of progress that is reliant upon the idea of history's constantly forward movement. This perception endorses and favors the continuum of history which is unfolded according to history's inner logic and normativity. The advance of history then becomes inevitable and takes on the form of a natural phenomenon. According to this approach, which reflects the view of the rulers, the victors of history, history is abstracted from social reality and follows a predetermined course at the service of progress and development. Unsurprisingly, whatever breaks up the continuum of history and opens up new possibilities for a different social organization is deemed as abnormality, underestimated, and, excuse me, underestimated and mystified. Subversive events and past struggles for social emancipation become a permanent source of annoyance for the status quo and subsequently have to be annihilated and erased from social memory. <laughs> 
Seen from this perspective, then, the most significant upheaval in post-war Europe, the May 1968 events, has to be defamed, buried, and entirely forgotten. Both intellectuals and politicians have repeatedly contributed to the construction of an official and dominant narrative of the May explosion, to the management of its memory and elimination of its political dimensions. According to Raymond Aron, this is Raymond Aron, for example, May 1968 was, quote, the event that turned out to have been a non-event, end quote. In other words, it did not exist as an event since nothing happened in May 1968. On the same wavelength, Pierre Nora categorically asserted that, quote, not only was there no revolution, but nothing tangible or palpable occurred at all, end quote. No one died in this, quote, soft revolution, as Lipovetsky named it. More recently, during the 2007 French election, Sarkozy condemned May 1968 and attacked the, quote, cynical and, quote, immoral left, stating that, quote, in this election it is a question of whether the heritage of May 68 should be perpetrated, excuse me, perpetuated, or if it should be liquidated once and for all, end quote. Or when the existence of the event is not questioned, then an effort has been widely made to interpret the revolt of May as a spiritual and cultural revolution. As a consequence, an image of a frozen past is constructed, and the events presented as having paved the way to contemporary individualism, emphasizing the importance of human rights and contributing to the emergence of postmodernism. In contradistinction to the above approaches, critical and radical theory does not compromise with continued forgetting and implemented forms of social amnesia. For the world of the exploited and the oppressed, history is a social product. Quote, history does nothing. History, quote, possesses no immense wealth. It, quote, wages no battles. It is man, real living man, who does all that, who possesses and fights. History is nothing but the activity of man pursuing his aims, end quote. I'm not sure who that quote is, but... Uh... For this concept of history, there is a continuity of the revolutionary struggles that breaks the homogenous time of official history and unifies the militant legacy, arguing that, quote, most of the past is interrupted future, future in the past, end quote. From this vantage point, then, as Marcuse argued, quote, Remembrance of the past may give rise to dangerous insights, and the established society seems to be apprehensive of the subversive tenets, contents of memory. Remembrance is a mode of dissociation from the given facts, a mode of, quote, mediation, which breaks for short moments the omnipresent power of the given facts. Memory recalls the terror and the hope that passed, both come to life again, but whereas in reality the former recurs in ever newer forms, the latter remains hope, end quote. Castor, I mean, Mar Herbert Marcuse. The revolutionary tradition includes terrors, sufferings, horrors, and tragedies, but also hopes, unfulfilled promises, and revolutionary inspirations. The heritage of May 1968 is not past history that is being disconnected from the present social struggles. Its subversive memory of resistance, struggle, and refusal reemerges as hope and militant optimism for the world of the ruled and revolted. In this sense, May 1968 carries a, quote, secret index, end quote, which is experienced in times of disobedience and revolt, wherein everything is at stake, history is opened, and nothing is impossible. For John Holloway, we discuss and reflect upon May 1968 because, quote, we are feeling lost and need some sense of direction, end quote. In Castoriadis's understanding, May 1968 should not be made in a, quote, engraving, a, quote, dead past, a closed or rigidified subject. On the contrary, its meaning, quote, remains wide open, end quote, and we go back to it in order to move forward. Quote, to transform things, we have to understand things. To advance, we have to orient ourselves, end quote. Taking May 1968 in this way implies a stance according to which, as Adorno put it, quote, criticism really means the same as remembrance, end quote. 
This in turn means the criticism that criticism should endeavor to be developed through a process of demystification that overcomes the reification of forgetting. Cutting through mystified appearances and rigidified facts, remembrance as part of the critical and radical tradition focuses on the essence of the mace explosion and stresses the, quote, substance of its demands and the meaning of its forms and modes of action, end quote. In its effort to reveal the essence of phenomenon, Castoriadis's criticism then conceives of the May events through the categories of, quote, crisis and, quote, critique. The revolt of May 1968 did not erupt due to an economic breakdown. May 68 was not the revolt result of financial collapse. As Castoriadis put it, the movement of 1968, quote, was provoked not by the hunger, end quote, or, quote, by some economic crisis, end quote. On the contrary, the breaking out of the events contributed to, quote, creating a crisis in the economy, end quote. The social upheaval was manifested as a massive refusal of key elements of the main productive and consumerist functionalities of capitalism, its instrumental rationality and the mechanization of life. The distinctiveness of Castoriadis's interpretation of the events lies in the fact that he understands the crisis as the result of the popular initiatives, of the collective actions taken by ordinary people in their universities, factories, offices, and neighborhoods. The crisis was not seen as the outcome of an economic or structural dysfunctionality, but as he argued, the, quote, crisis, bracket, was unleashed by a few enragés from Nantir, shaking French society from its roots to the summits of power, end quote. It was a, quote, radical break, a, quote, radical revolutionary affirmation, end quote, which revealed the, quote, immense creative potential of society, end quote. The unfolding of the crisis disclosed the, quote, insurmountable and, quote, fundamental contradiction of bureaucratic capitalist society, end quote, which, quote, manifests itself in bureaucratic capitalism's need to exclude people from the management of their own affairs and in its inability to succeed in excluding people from the management of their own affairs. If capitalism were to succeed, it would immediately collapse due to its very success. Capitalism's human and political expression is to be found in the bureaucrats' project of transforming people into objects, whether by violence, mystification, manipulation, teaching methods, or economic, quote, carrots, and in people's refusal to let it happen, end quote. Castoriadis. Sorry, one second. Seen from this viewpoint, then, the crisis of May 1968 is considered as being in an immediate relation to the explosive subjectivity and people's power of negativity. In Castoriadis' understanding, the crisis was also experienced as a critique and rejection both of structuralism and of traditional forms of political organization. Castoriadis does not only broach the theme of the stance adopted by the major spokesmen of structuralism during the May days, Castoriadis is mainly concerned with the effect that May 1968 had on structuralist thought itself as a whole. Castoriadis's criticism was launched from the standpoint of the revolted subjectivity, and the May events acted as the practical and conceptual backdrop against which he sought to deepen his critique of structuralism. As Castoriadis characteristically argued, quote, while a new contest contestation was developed, developing, while people were searching for and beginning to create new attitudes, norms, values, the accent was placed on, quote, structures, so as to evacuate living history, end quote. Accordingly, structuralism was not simply put into crisis during the May Revolt, but as he opined, quote, quote, structuralism melted away, end quote. As, quote, living history came to evacuate structuralism, end quote. As a motto read on the walls of the Sorbonne in May 1968, quote, structures don't go down into the streets, end quote. History is made by men, not by structures. Damn, that's fresh. The May days were one of these, quote, rare moments when society of these, quote, rare moments when society is at boiling point and therefore fluid, end quote. 
Throughout the uprising, the volcanic explosion of the insurgents opened up the way for solidarity and re-socialization that was pointing to a radically new way of life and socio-political organization. The development of bottom-up initiatives and participatory forms of organization created a space for the unfolding of non-state-oriented politics independent of political parties and state structures. These anti-state forms of organization were experimented on in various forms of direct democracy, sit-ins, occupations, action committees, strikes, and open assemblies. Traditional forms of political organization, such as political parties and trade unions, were fiercely rejected in a common public area of struggles, militant protests, common assemblies, street battles, and occupations of public buildings was created. The movement of May challenged the established presuppositions of regarding the hierarchical organization of society and promoted the aim of autonomy in and through the, quote, autonomous and democratic self-management of collectivities, end quote. The social explosion posed the question once again in the history of the radical movement vis-a-vis -vis the forms of organization and emancipatory movement. The revolt had created a community of struggle that experienced, quote, something of the freedom and the spontaneity which will mark the future, end quote. This spontaneity expressed in and through open assemblies and radical activities was their self-organization. In a parallel way, the social unrest revealed the fact that opposition to fetishized state organizational forms does not mean that the struggle against the capitalist social relations has to be developed without organization. As Castoriadis argued, quote, to accept that spontaneity and organization are mutually exclusive is to give over the field of organization to the bureaucrats, end quote. Precisely for that reason, he maintained that, quote, one cannot overcome bureaucratic organization by refusing all organization, end quote. Moving beyond the dilemma between the Leninist tradition of the Revolutionary Party on the one hand and the lack of any organization for the fear of the movement's potential integration and absorption into the established order, on the other, Castoriadis made it clear that, quote, someone who is afraid of co-optation has already been co-opted. His attitude has been co-opted since it has been blocked up. The deepest reaches of his mind have been co-opted, for there he seeks guarantees against being co-opted. And thus he has already been caught in the trap of reactionary ideology, the search for an anti-co-optation talisman or fetishistic magic charm, end quote, Castoriadis. For Castoriadis, quote, everything can be co-opted save one thing, our own reflective critical autonomous activity, end quote. The living movement of the people in May 1968 demonstrated that forms of political organization should not be presupposed as given or external structures. Deploying the dialectics of struggle and organization, Luxembourg argued that means of struggle and forms of organization, quote, arise as a product of the struggle, end quote, and ought to be, quote, tested in the struggle, end quote. Of all these forms of struggle are always in, excuse me, all of these forms of struggle are always in a fluid situation. They are constantly moving and changing in and through the reciprocal mediation of theory and practice. As Luxembourg put it, all of the different forms of struggle discovered by the movement, quote, run through one another, run side by side, cross one another, flow in and over one another. It is a ceaselessly moving, changing sea of phenomenon, end quote. For Castoriadis, quote, openness is that which constantly displaces and transforms its own terms and even its own field, but can exist only if, at each instant, it leans on a provisional organization of the field, end quote. The collective and radical praxis of those involved in the social unrest posed the question as regards the means and relation, and the answer was given by the revolted themselves through the formation of, quote, open assemblies, end quote. Open assemblies were the spontaneous forms of organization which brought together the elements of openness and organization, united concrete aspects of self-discipline and freedom. These forms of negativity and self-organization contradicted the conservative political line of the various, quote, central committees and transcended in 
practice the pre-existing division within the radical movement between the rulers and the rule, the directors and the performers, and the various forms of self-determination, the insurgents depicted the anti-authoritarian and libertarian tendencies in the movement. They stopped capitalized time and performed through the open assemblies against the, quote, rationalization, end quote, of politics. By extension, they faced, quote, the central in question of all political activity, end quote, which is, quote, the question of the institution, end quote. Castoriatus. The posing of the above question disclosed profoundly contradictory aspects of the movement, which for Castoriatus are undoubtedly correlated with the, quote, antinomic character of the modern political imagination. This imagination is, on the one hand, under the sway of the aim of autonomy and its successive extensions into the various fields in which the social sphere is instituted. On the other hand, it seldom and only for a brief time manages to disengage itself from the representation of politics and of the institution as an exclusive domain of the state and from the representation of this state as belonging only to itself." End quote. The movement was marked from this tension. That is, the development of the aim of, the indivi of individual and social autonomy, which is manifested in various forms of extra-institutional opposition, and the attempt made by many j political groups or a part of the movement anchored in state-oriented politics to channel the insurrection within the limits of capitalist society and its state. The lesson of the May explosion was that political action that is extra-institutional but within society radicalizes the political class struggle and cannot be incorporated within the system. On this point, Johannes Agnoli made a very significant remark about the influence of the 1968 movement. Quote, to act extra-institutionally within society assures the possibility of influence. In this regard, the experience of the 1968 movement is very instructive. It was able to exert political influence only for as long as it did not participate in a direct and immediate sense in state politics. Staatspolitik. Its ratio emancipationist Vernunft came into play as long as it assembled into the streets. Excuse me, as long as it assembled in the streets. Its Vernunft went astray as soon as the movement began the long institutional march. End quote. Johannes Agnoli. I have essays of Agnoli on the, the page if folks are interested. By reflecting upon this contradiction, Castoriadis endeavored to draw lessons which have wider resonance for the radical and anti-capitalist social struggles. On the one hand, he made the interesting remark that due to this antinomy, quote, the result has been that in modernity, politics as collective activity, and not as a specialized profession, has been able to pr be present so far only as spasm and paroxysm, about a fever, enthusiasm, and rage, a reaction to the excess of power, end quote. On the other hand, Castoriadis sought to grasp the concept of revolution as a process that goes beyond temporal social explosions and the bureaucratic decline of radical movements, upheavals, and forms of organized social struggle. The autonomous collective actions which are expressed as short-lived angry outbursts can easily be absorbed into the dominant praxis. In fact, these ephemeral upsurges act as safety valves assisting the established order to continue to exist by modernizing itself. They play a regulative role and enhance the resilience and flexibility of capitalist and authoritarian normality.
Castoriadis examined what the history of these uprisings can teach us in order to cease being trapped in the impasse of temporary social eruptions. On the one hand, and the decay of enduring patterns of social and political organization on the other. For Castoriadis, the real challenge, challenge was rather to realize why the, quote, truly socialist elements, end quote, that were brought about in the course of radical social struggles, quote, cannot maintain themselves or develop or above all be instituted, end quote. Without denying the power of negative thinking and practice, the, quote, violence of the negative, end quote, Castoriadis maintained that, quote, negativity as pure negativity is only an abstraction and therefore at bottom a piece of speculative mystification, end quote. The historical experience of May 1968 and past social explosions show that if the revolted have not created their own culture in something, quote, positive, end quote, to rely upon after the slowdown of the outbreak, then they inescapably, quote, fell back upon the, quote, positive, end quote, aspect of capitalism, end quote. That is why, according to Castoriadis, the most vital question from a practical, critical point of view posed by May 1968 and its aftermath is, quote, how would this tremendous explosion be able to go beyond the stage of mere explosion without losing its creativity? How would this fantastic deployment of autonomous activity be able to institute lasting collective organizations that express it without drying it up or confiscating it? How would the contents that it was contents that it was creating in abundance be able to find new forms, above all political forms? that would permit them to rise to the level of full social historical effectiveness, end quote. Castoriadis. The overt political and social manifestation of crisis in May 1968 has been a significant point of reference that marked the history, politics, culture, and societal tendencies of contemporary societies. Capital and capital state have been constantly attacking the social explosion of 1968 with a view to annihilating its meaning and erasing 1968's political and anti-capitalist dimensions. Over and over again, they have endeavored to reappropriate and reabsorb the rebellion into the mechanisms of their domination and power. The events have been presented as an isolated fact, a temporary event or an accident that had no deeper correlations. With distinct traits and contradictions of the post World War capitalist society. In Castoriadis' view, by contrast, quote, accident is the form, the appearance that various sorts of crises take when they break out. It is the nature of the capitalist social relations that produces these accidents in a periodic way, as Castoriadis put it, quote, by crises, we do not mean or do not only mean economic crises, but also periods of social life where any kind of event, whether economic, political, social, or international, significantly upsets the current functioning of society, temporarily incapacitates existing institutions and mechanisms, and prevents them from immediately reestablishing equilibrium. In this sense, crises, whatever their origin, are inherent in the very nature of the capitalist system. They express its fundamental irrationality and incoherence. In this respect, end quote, Castoriadis. In this respect, the crisis of May 1968, with all its marked characteristics and peculiarities, belong to a more profound general crisis, which characterizes modern Western societies. The events of May just made explicit what was subterranean and implicit. <laughs> 
Section 2. Crisis, Reification, and Class Struggle Since the 1950s, Castoriadis had expressed remarkable opinions on the origins and substance of this multilateral crisis of modernity, which reflect his intellectual trajectory in subsequent conceptual turns. The Second World War period and the post-war phase confirmed the crisis and revealed its profound character, which is inherent in the nature and organization of modern societies. According to Castoriadis, both the U.S. and Russian bureaucratic modes of social organization are torn by a crisis which is premised upon the split and heightened conflict between directors and executants in the process of production. The directors and the smooth functioning of capitalist social relations are reliant upon the autonomous, independent, and creative initiatives of the executants, but at the same time, they tend to control, repress, and inhibit these expressions of autonomy as an uncontrollable passion of this creativity would threaten their power and the existence of the bureaucratic system itself. However, should the directors in manage entirely to block the creativity and autonomy of the rule, then the system would collapse. This internal social, economic, and political contradiction amounts to an enduring source of instability and crisis. On the other hand, constitutes a reproductive mechanism that reaffirms the guarantee and guarantees the persistence and perpetuation of the capitalist system. From Castoriadis's point of view, the, quote, crisis of exploitative society, end quote, is manifested in a double manner, and it is, quote, expressed in two forms, both as the workers struggle against the alienation, excuse me, against alienation and against its conditions, and as people's absence from society, their passivity, discouragement, retreat, and isolation. In both cases, beyond a certain point, this conflict leads to the overt crisis of the established society, end quote. The Hungarian events of 1956 encapsulate an example of the unfolding of crisis as the result of the explosive power of struggle and revolted subjectivity, while the breakdown of the Polish economy around the same time is indicative of a crisis that stemmed from a state of generalized alienation and social apathy. Starting from the first part of his premise, that is, the role of social struggle as generator of the crisis, Castoriadis shifted the em emphasis of his analysis from the objective contradictions of capitalism, an approach that was the focal point of the thought and practice of traditional Marxism, to the actual social activity of people and their struggles. It was class struggle itself and by no means the objective economic laws of capitalism that determined the level of wages as well as the development of technology, production, economy, and politics. Reflecting upon the unfolding of the working class revolutions from 1848 to 1956, Castoriadis argued that there was a positive, quote, process of development, end quote, of proletarian action, though, quote, interrupted and contradictory, end quote but absolutely not an objective one. Rather, there was the, quote, development of the embodied meaning of working class action, end quote. And all of these vibrant class struggles deeply modified the character of modern capitalism. Seeking a non-deterministic theory of crisis, he placed particular stress on the dynamic of class struggle in order to explicate capitalist crises. This line of analysis led him to argue that the crisis of modernity, the crises of modernity are, quote, the byproduct of struggle, end quote. They could be ascribed to the fact that, quote, people do not submit passively to the present organization of society, but react and struggle against it in a great many ways, end quote. In contradistinction to widespread traditional Marxist views, Castoriadis grasped the concept of crisis as a category of social contradiction, as a constant trend inherent in capitalist social relations. This approach allows Castoriadis to put forward the fundamental contradiction of capitalism, which lies in production and work, and constitutes the main source of its crisis. Quote, this contradiction is contained within the alienation experienced by every worker. 
We may summarize this alienation by pointing out capitalism's need to reduce workers to the role of mere executants and the inability of this system to function if it succeeded in achieving this required objective. In other words, capitalism needs to realize simultaneously the participation and exclusion of the workers in the production process. The same goes for citizens in the public in the political sphere, and so on and so forth. End quote. Castoriadis does not draw a clear distinction between the concepts of alienation and reification. Though the Marxian concepts of fetishism and alienation and Lukács' theory of reification inform his account of the crisis, excuse me, inform his account of crisis, the three concepts are used interchangeably. It seems that in his analysis of the fundamental contradiction of capitalism, the three conceptions overlap and are treated as synonymous. In most cases, fetishism and alienation are grouped under the notion of reification. In Castoriadis's approach, then, the notion of reification is described as the process of transformation of human beings into things. In other words, of Castoriadis, quote, Reification, the essential tendency of capitalism, can never be wholly realized. If reification were wholly realized, if the system were actually able to change individuals into things moved on by economic, quote, forces, it would collapse not in the long run, but immediately. The struggle of people against reification is, just as much as the tendency towards reification, the condition for the functioning of capitalism. A factory in which the workers were really and totally mere cogs in the machine, blindly executing the orders of management, would come to a stop in a quarter of an hour. As indicated by the above, Castoriadis perceives reification as thingification, which is not a static, accomplished and fixed category, but rather should be understood as a dynamic concept that mirrors a contradictory and antagonistic relationship between directors and executants. This processual and dialectical understanding of the concept of reification plays an important role in the manner in which Castoriadis associates the contradictions and crises of modern societies with cap class struggles and resistance, as he put it. Quote, Capitalism can function only by continually drawing upon the genuinely human activity of those subject to capitalism, while at the same time trying to level and dehumanize them as much as possible. Capitalism can continue to function only to the extent that, capitalism that capitalism's profound tendency, which actually is reification, is not realized to the extent that its norms are continually countered in their application. Analysis shows that the final contradiction of capitalism resides here, and not in so, the so, to speak, mechanical incompatibilities presented by the economic gravitation of human molecules in the system. These incompatibilities are ultimately illusory, even though they go beyond particular and localized phenomenon. End quote, Castoriadis. Castoriadis reiterates the same reasoning by making the same point over and over again in an attempt to construe crisis not just as an economic phenomenon, but rather as a crisis of capitalist social relations, including political and cultural ones. Under the influence of Lukács' and Weber's positions, Castoriadis conceives of this process of dehumanization and depersonalization as a generalized reification that perpetuates, excuse me, that penetrates not only individuals but also social institutions as well as the political and cultural domain. The crisis thus becomes all-embracing as reification extends from the sphere of production to the most important facets of contemporary societies. According to Castoriadis, quote, Capitalism is built on an intrinsic contradiction, dot, dot, dot. 
The capitalist organization of society is contradictory in the same way that a neurotic individual is contradictory. The capitalist organization of society can try to carry out its intentions only through acts that constantly thwart these same intentions. Quote, end quote, Castoriadis. Quote, Castoriadis. Let us look at this first at the most basic level, at the point of production. The capitalist system can only maintain itself by continually trying to reduce wage earners to the level of pure executants. And it functions only to the extent that it never succeeds in so reducing them. Capitalism is constantly obliged to solicit the participation of wage earners in the production process, and yet it also tends to render this participation impossible. The same contradiction is found again in an almost identical form in the domains of politics and culture. End quote. Castoriadis. One moment. Sorry, had to save something. <laughs> Deriving from this long-standing accumulated contradiction of capitalist societies, the ensuing multilateral crisis discloses the crisis-ridden nature of capitalism and the fragility of capitalist social relations. In Castoriadis's discussion, however, the concept of crisis is not always seen as an open, fluid, and antagonistic process of struggle. It appears that capital always has the initiative. It is constantly the subject. Thus, he underscores and stresses the power and domination of capital, which makes decisions about what the working class, class should and should not do. The struggles of the workers are thus apprehended as an external reaction, and the relationship between capital and labor appears to be an external one, a mere opposition of labor to the attacks of capital. In Castoriadis' words, quote, the system necessarily engenders opposition, a struggle against it by those upon whom it seeks to impose it, end quote. Castoriadis grasps crisis as the, quote, consequence of a wave of struggle or militancy, end quote, and not as a tendency, quote, embedded in the form of the class antagonism, end quote. Castoriadis. The intrinsic contradictions of capitalism are thus separated from class struggle, and hence the relationship between crisis and struggle is disarticulated and turns out to be an external one. In this way, capital appears to be determined by definite laws to have its own logic, whose irrationality and incoherence creates the conditions for the working class's rebellion, disorder, and crisis. Crisis is conceptualized as having ensued from the self-activity of capital, the self-contradictory and problematic character of capitalism, which is torn deterministically by its own contradictions and, the cons and inconsistencies, and not by the social antagonism with the working class. Capital is understood as a self-referring economic category, a machine-like entity, and not as the product of two antagonistic poles of a social relation, that exists as a movement of contradiction between dependence and separation of capital and labor. Castoriadis theorizes the capitalist crisis by underestimating, quote, capital's dependence upon the subordination of labor, end quote, and consequently he undervalues, quote, the late power of labor as internal contradiction within capital, end quote. As he shows, quote, no understanding of the way in which the insubordination of labor constitutes the weakness of capital, especially in capitalist crisis, end quote. At the core of Castoriadis's position, class and class struggle are seen as fundamental and of major importance, but the internal relation between capital and labor is reduced to an external one, a relation of mere oppositional conflict. As Castoriadis pointed out, quote, the capitalist structure of society consists of organizing people's lives from the outside. 
and creates a perpetually renewed crisis in every sphere of human activity, end quote. Castoriadis. The internal instability and fragility of capital is not traced in the subsistence of living labor as an antagonistic force inside capital as a power that constitutes, permeates, and negates perverted capitalist forms. In this respect, for Castoriadis, the volatility of capital and the limits of capitalist domination are not grounded in the insubordinate power of labor as an internal contradiction within capital. They are rather located in the contradictory relation between participation and exclusion, which now becomes the obstacle to capitalist development and generates crises and instability. The significance of Castoriadis's argument lies in the fact that he conceives of crises as inherent and reoccurring results of the reified capitalist social relations. He points out that the alienated and reified workers constitute a boundary to alienation and further reification. Because of both their resistance and their profound objectification that threatens to reduce them to mere non-creative and unproductive reified things. In the imaginary institution of society, Castoriadis made a similar point by emphasizing the, quote, struggle of people against reification, end quote, as one of the main parameters of the fundamental contradiction of capitalism, although Castoriadis treats struggle as, quote, the condition for the functioning of capitalism, end quote. In this kind of case, Castoriadis raises an issue of great theoretical importance, and he appears to make sense of the internal relation between capital and labor, though at times he perceives it in a problematic and ambivalent way. Class struggle remains the connecting thread linking with his previous analysis, but he emphasizes the role of class antagonism as being indispensable for the stability, development, and reproduction of the capitalist social relations. He argued, quote, capitalism can function only insofar as those, upon, those whom it exploits actively oppose everything the system seeks to impose upon them, end quote. Castoriadis. Castoriadis birches a theoretical theme that echoes Adorno's views, which asserted that society has perpetuated itself because of its contradictions and opposing interests. Mankind survives and, quote, preserves itself not despite all irrationalities and conflicts, but by virtue of them, end quote. I don't know if that's Castoriadis or Adorno, but I think, it might, I think it's Adorno. The social division into antagonistic class relationships between the rulers and ruled reproduces the system and assists it in extending itself as, quote, society stays alive, not despite its antagonism, but by means of it, end quote. I don't know who's saying who there, but... Anyway, in the first place... And in a manner similar to Adorno's approach, Castoriadis's contention that class struggle reproduces capitalist social relations could be understood as a defense of the power of negativity and conflict and against the voices and demand that demand reconciliation, conformism, and compromise. Second, and in distinction to traditional Marxist theory, Castoriadis's line of reasoning could be grasped as a critique of the understanding of labor as a transhistorical and fetishized appearance as a new ontology that is used for the creation of, quote, one vast labor camp, the global gulag, end quote, as the only alternative to capitalist society. From this vantage point, Castoriadis's point challenges the traditional views that have reduced class struggle to a set of reformist demands that seek to improve the capitalist societal conditions, by fighting for better salaries, and by operating constructively within the existing political order. As Castoriadis put it, within its current limits, the continuous rise in workers' real wages not only does not undermine the foundations of capitalism as a system, but is the condition for its survival, end quote. The traditional un the trade unionist militancy that focuses merely on economic demands and struggles for wage increases without fundamentally challenging the capitalist social relations 
is easily absorbed within the capitalist system. It also creates the basis for irrevocable bureaucratization of these organizations, which becomes an indispensable regenerative and stabilizing cog in the process of capitalist reproduction. Practicism and tacticism have led to a sterile spectrum spectacular and lifestyle activism that presents itself as class struggle and has transformed the latter into a means of maintaining and reproducing the system itself. In this respect, as Adorno argued, social struggle and practice have become, quote, a piece of the politics it was supposed to lead out of. It became the prey of power, end quote. On the other hand, Castoriadis's views pertaining to class struggle as the condition for the functioning of capitalism could lead to deterministic, reformist, and fatalistic interpretations, which are also related to Castoriadis' theory of crisis. The function of labor and class struggle is seen as subsisting in and against capital, as always being part of the logic of capital, but having now taken a secondary role. Class struggle and labor are constantly integrated into the network of capitalist social relations and the potential to move, quote, beyond, end quote, capital is canceled and dismissed. Class struggle thus becomes predictable. It is located in a predetermined and closed framework, and it acts as a positive component for the reproduction of capitalism, losing any potential to play a subversive and emancipatory role. This line implies a fetishization of the power of capital and a concurrent underestimation of the power of labor and class struggle. Capital is thus understood as a subject that follows a predetermined course that always incorporates class conflict as their outcome is known in advance. Within the presupposed and objective framework of existing class relations, the future is foreclosed and social practice is constructed in terms of subordination to a teleological and deterministic scheme. Castoriadis, who fiercely castigated the determinism of traditional Marxism, could now be read as reintroducing a determinist view of historical development in which the future in, is inscribed in abstract historical laws and any resistance is doomed to failure. As a consequence, class struggle does not tend to social and human emancipation, but is reduced to performing a reproductive and stabilizing function within capitalism. This, in turn, intermingles with Castoriadis' theory of crisis. A crisis could be seen as a mechanism that facilitates the capitalist reproduction through the regeneration of bourgeois structures and institutions. As he noted, quote, the proletariat enables capitalism to continue by acting against the system, end quote. The danger here is that Castoriadis' views about the issue of crisis could be conceptualized as not being related to class struggle in the direction of the radical transformation of the system. The issue at stake is whether his theory of crisis is to be understood not as a radical break with capitalism, but crises to be encapsulated. As Negri and Hart have pointed out, as the, quote, norm of modernity, end quote, since, quote, as it is for modernity as a whole, crisis is for capital a normal op condition that indicates not its end, but its tendency and mode of operation, end quote. Following Lefebvre, the crisis of modernity, modernity appears to be, quote, total and permanent, total in that it throws its into question values and norms as much as socioeconomic structures, permanent in that it is not making for some solution to the crisis, but seems rather to constitute the very mode of existence of, quote, modern, end quote, societies, end quote. For Castor, uh, Henri Lefebvre. For Castoriadis, the capitalist mode of organization is, quote, profoundly irrational and full of contradictions. Under it, repeated crises of one kind or another are absolutely inevitable, end quote. 
does this unavoidability and recur reoccurring character of crisis amount to a neglect of the revolutionary potential and an uncritical affirmation of the established order with some of the later Castoriotis' fashionable philosophical terms as an ornament of conformism and reconciliation. Castoriotis acknowledges that, quote, only the class struggle can give the contradictions and crises of modern society a revolutionary character. And he notes that workers, can, quote, cannot resolve the problems without abolishing capitalism and the bureaucracy in totally reconstructing society, end quote. Historiatus. At times, however, this approach to the phenomenon of crisis tends to be ambivalent, seeing that he seeks the solution to capitalist crises by substituting the dynamic of class struggle and the historical and specific analysis of social relations with norms and abstractions, without thereby developing his point concerning the relationship between crisis and struggle and to its radical implications. Castoriotis' point of departure in analyzing the phenomenon of crisis is shifted, therefore, from locating the contradiction to work and production to an examination of every societal domain. Instead of focusing his argumentation on the antagonism between capital and labor, he proceeds to investigate the genesis of crisis as the product of the conflict between directors and executants. Capitalist social relations are challenged enduringly by this internal contradiction which is spread to all of society due to the development of capitalism and the expansion of capitalist relations owing to the rising tide of the bureaucratic management of society. While a critique of labor and production in capitalism continues to be part of his mode of thought, Castoriadis gradually turned his emphasis to the determining role of state and bureaucracy. This approach is tied, excuse me, was tied to an attempt to dissociate himself from Marx and Marxism and at the same time was bound up with his stress on the role of hierarchy and bureaucratic social structures. In this way, in Castoriadis' critique of capitalist relations and subsequently in his interpretation of the phenomenon of crisis, class relations are reduced to power relations. By doing this, he introduces a disarticulation of separation of exploitation and domination, and he thus fails to grasp the interweaving character of the two concepts, which are not mutually exclusive, but on the contrary, complement and presuppose each other within capitalist social relations. This approach lessened the effectiveness of Castoriadis' interpretation of the crisis of modern society and led him to produce abstractions and generalizations. Section 3. Crisis and the Odyssey of the Project of Autonomy in his later theoretical elaborations, Castoriadis rightly criticized the usage of the terms, quote, modern and, quote, postmodern, and the periodization of Western European and U.S. history on the basis of the above designations. He also appears to be well aware of the, quote, schematic character of all periodizations, of the risk of neglecting continuities and connections, or of the, quote, subjective, end quote, element involved, end quote. Nonetheless, Castoriadis espoused a similar way of interpreting history by unfolding his own scheme of periodization, which of course this time relied upon his philosophical and theoretical assumptions. The criterion for the division of history into fundamentally distinct periods applied was, quote, the specificity of the imaginary significations, end quote, which mark and determine each period. In the case of Castoriadis' analysis, the specificity of Western European history from the 12th century to the present could be evaluated and understood in accordance with the, quote, signification and the project of social and individual autonomy, end quote. 
Based upon the criterion of autonomy, Castoriadis divided European history into three periods. The first from the 12th to the early 18th century is marked by the emergence constitution of the West. During this period and for the first time after the collapse of ancient Greek democracy, the project of autonomy recurred after 15 centuries of non-existence. The second era lasted 150 years from 1800 to 1950, and it was characterized by a creative explosion in all spheres of social life resulting in the radicalization of the project of autonomy. This modern period witnessed the emergence and creation of capitalism, which, quote, embodies a new social imaginary signification, the unlimited expansion of, quote, rational mastery, end quote, end quote. Throughout this historical stage, the conflict between the two imaginary significations, that is to say the struggle between autonomy and unlimited expansion of, quote, rational mastery, end quote, defined the character of the socioeconomic reality and constituted the driving force of the extraordinary growth and advance of Western societies. Finally, the third period, which started in 1950, is the epoch of a generalized conformism. The social and political conflicts disappeared. And more precisely, after the, quote, semi-failures, end quote, of the social movements of the 1960s, quote, the project of autonomy seems totally eclipsed, end quote. From 1950 onward, a date which Castoriadis himself admits is, quote, evidently arbitrary, end quote. The Western world entered a period of crisis. The crisis has penetrated every aspect of the Western liberal model and has extended generalized conformism to all levels of daily life. Castoriadis takes issue with Habermas's stance toward modernity and his preconception that preconceptions that associate modernity with the Hegelian philosophical doctrine. As Castoriadis commented, quote, actual history is replaced once again with the history of ideas, end quote. Yet Castoriadis's direct engagement with the problematic of modernity and its subsequent crisis follows the same logic. Departing from a concrete analysis of the contradictions rooted in production and social relations, he replaces actual history, conflicts, and struggles with the history of social imaginary significations. This time, the antagonism between labor and capital or between directors and executants is restored and substantiated into the struggle between autonomy and capitalist rationalization. Castoriadis's method was to proceed by adopting an ideal typical approach, and consequently he did not ground historical and social development socially. Hippolyte argued that for Hegel, quote, the collapse of the ancient world is the source of a permanent division in the modern world, end quote. For Papayuanu, in Phenomenology of Mind, Hegel maintained that philosophy could reveal the, quote, great necessity, end quote, of history and show the, quote, absolute necessity of Christian misfortune and modern alienation, end quote. Having passed through the Greek polis, the spirit had to destroy its community life, quote, because the polis had no notion of subjectivity, the individual and his infinite value, end quote. Afterwards, the spirit lived in, quote, misfortune, end quote, end quote, alienation during the 2,000 years of Christianity, which, quote, sliced the world into two, depreciated the here and now to the profit of, of the hereafter, even rendering man miserable, end quote. For Hegel, according to Papayuanu, from the downfall of the ancient world onwards, all history is the history of the alienation of man. Thus, since the decline of the ancient polis, Hegel considered history as an alienation that expanded to every aspect of the human experience and came to an end at the outbreak of the French Revolution. By the same token, for Castoriadis, the social imaginary signification of autonomy appears to function in a manner akin to the Hegelian notion of the evolution of the spirit. Hegel, according to Karl Kosick, constructed his work in a, quote, metaphysical motif, end quote. That is, the motif of a, quote, odyssey, and more specifically, quote, the odyssey of the spirit, end quote.
Similarly, Castori Odyssey's motif is unfolded as the odyssey of the project of autonomy. The project of autonomy emerged in ancient Greece, and when the project of autonomy was eclipsed, or rather, it became an independent reality, and it was wandering 17 centuries in the mystery clou misty clouds of history for the project of autonomy's reemergence in Western Europe during the 12th century. History is reformulated as the history of the project of autonomy. The project of autonomy's successive emergence and eclipse within a framework of a peculiar Western Eurocentrism which seems to overlook the history of the people in Latin America, Asia, and Africa. The concept of autonomy not only takes us beyond the analysis of social and economic reality, but is also utilized as a measure for other cultures and other people's struggles. The notion of autonomy serves as a concept of historical periodization and misses the historically specific and contradictory social foundations of various patterns of capitalist development. It acts as an abstract, quote, norm or, quote, model, which departs from the distinct historical tendencies and certainly fails to accommodate the resurgence of social struggles after the 1960s or 1990s. Paradoxically, Castoriadis' views resemble the theories regarding the end of history, as for him, since 1950, and especially after the movements of the 1960s, capitalism has been advancing and, quote, expanding without any effective internal opposition, and, quote, modernity is finished, end quote, as a social reality that was shaped in and through the unfolding of the project of social and individual autonomy. Castoriadis asserted that, quote, the project of autonomy itself is certainly not finished, end quote, and argued that, quote, it would be absurd to try to decide whether we are living through a long parenthesis or we are witnessing, witnessing the beginning of the end of Western history as the history linked with the project of autonomy and co-determined by it, end quote. At any rate, his ideal typical approach not only leads to an eclectic depiction of the past, but also amounts to an abstract model for future development in which a potential reemergence of the project of autonomy seals the vitality and dynamics of capitalist society. Castoriadis's later theoretical development also involved a turning towards placing much more emphasis on the social, human, political, and cultural character of the crisis. In this process, Castoriadis developed insights that are worthy of attention and made remarks that have wider resonance in terms of shedding light on the financial crisis that erupted in 2008. Radical Marxist or left interpretations of the post-2008 crisis focus almost exclusively on the financial aspect of the crisis and, therefore, is striking how much less attention has been paid to the wider and multilateral character of the crisis. One second. In Castoriadis' interpretation of the phenomenon of crisis, the economic crisis can be understood as a symptom of the process of a generalized decomposition and decline of capitalist societies. This decay is evident as a crisis of social and human values, or as a crisis in the meaning of life and of human motives, which have led to the emptiness and poverty of everyday life. Crisis, then, is not only a life without an economic and professional future. Crisis is also the dislocation of social reality, and the destruction of communities and collective ways of life, which have caused a tremendous psychological and moral disintegration, and a massive spread of mental de degradation mental degradation. Crisis appears as, quote, a void of signification, end quote, as a crisis of the significations and meanings that used to hold modern societies together. The values that have become dominant are, quote, consumption, quote, money, and, quote, power. But these ideals are unable to supply people with the intensificate with a positive motive and to fill both personal and social life. This procedure and the intensification of the crisis posed 
the crucial issue concerning the meaning of human existence, which is also manifested in the privatization of the people and the process of desocialization that they are going through. As Castoriadis characteristically put it, referring to the modern individual, quote, he runs, he jogs, he shops in supermarkets, he goes channel surfing, end quote, but, quote, nothing he does has the slightest meaning, end quote. The inability of modern people to give a positive orientation, a content and meaning to their lives, discloses the emptiness of neoliberal normative values. The traditional roles and values which used to be necessary for the social cohesion of capitalist societies are undergoing a tremendous crisis. Neoliberal bearings are increasingly losing their strength and the vitality that allowed the process of social integration and identification to be carried out. More and more modern people realize that they cannot find human motives and a positive meaning of life in neoliberalism. This dissociation escalates the crisis of neoliberal societies and this crisis, quote, produces the crisis of the identification process. And at the same time, it is reproduced and aggravated by the crisis of identification, end quote. In his discussion with Christopher Lash concerning, quote, the culture of narcissism, Castoriadis observed that since the end of the 1950s and due to the growing integrative power of capitalism, the advancing rise of consumerism and the decline of traditional working class organizations, people had started retreating into their private sphere. Life came to denote a struggle for survival. The expression, quote, one day at a time, end quote, not only captures well the lack of an individual and social project, but also signifies that the time horizon has been transformed into a private one. Quote, nobody participates in a public time horizon, end quote. According to Castoriadis, modern capitalist societies not only undermined traditional forms of public time and space, but also came to the point where they destroyed the, quote, anthropological types that have conditioned the system's very existence, end quote. These anthropological types enabled the capitalist system to function and advance. They included the, quote, Schumpeter-style entrepreneur, end quote, as well as, quote, incorruptible judges, honest Weberian-style civil servants, teachers devoted to their vocation, workers with at least a minimum of conscientiousness about their work, and so on, end quote. In view of this, and by means of mainstream media, the political and social changes on a global level, and a neoliberal economic and credit policy, a very particular type of individual was brought about in mass, and an endeavor was made for a new, quote, anthropological type, end quote, to be instituted. The new liberal and modern individual had to hard work hard to calculate and not to think or reflect, to be efficient and not creative, to substitute quantity and speed for quality. They had to be flexible in every aspect of their life to establish networks of public relations and not to make friendships. They appear to be confused, emotionally unstable, unbalanced, and disorganized. Giving freely emotions and love were decried as old-fashioned and naive virtues. There was no space for a poetic and romantic way of living for tenderness and solidarity. There was no room for passion, earnestness, dignity, and integrity. A person by their human nature is bad and cunning. They had to be cool, insolent, and selfish. In the end, they had to appear stupid and satisfied. At the same time, the human body was glorified and set in the service of career and financial success. The body was reduced to vulgar flesh. You can do anything in order to succeed in your objectives, provided you are not having trouble with the law. Body, mind, and soul had to be separate from each other and resolve into exchange values. Doing was detached from thinking and feeling. You needed to know how to sell yourself to, quote, loot, end quote, the others, to use them. Every action which was profitable was morally accepted and socially valued. The new neoliberal human characters had to be transmuted into heartless, cruel, and callous beings that had to constantly move and be in uncertainty to live and feel like monads, live, excuse me, nomads and migrants within their own country. As Polanyi put it, a market economy can exist and function only in a market society. Concomitantly, 
The political, cultural, and ecological crises represent aspects of the general and profound crisis of modern societies. Over the last 40 years and more, systematically after the demise of Soviet-type societies, the ruling classes in the neoliberal capitalist world have made an effort to impose upon the working class the market liberal norms, bearings, motivations, and values, individualism, career, productivity, efficiency, privatization, free market economy, globalization, lifestyle, flexibility, gain, consumption, and superficiality. Their main objective was to achieve and maintain the social cohesion necessary for further capitalist development and expansion. It was a social and cultural, quote, revolution of the rulers and privileged against the working classes in an attempt to reorient the content of their lives by filling them with new social and cultural values. Yet, however much the bourgeois class, with the support of the private mass media and the, quote, vacuum industry, end quote, attempted to present neoliberal ideas, and attitudes as natural, immutable, and eternal, they have remained abstract, one-dimensional, and non-natural. And, as Hegel argued, quote, to make abstractions hold good in actuality means to destroy actuality, end quote. The imposition of the neoliberal abstractions precipitated social dislocations and the deconstruction, excuse me, the destruction of social reality, of modern social relations. It left a, quote, cultural vacuum, end quote, and caused a psychological and moral disintegration. As a result, contemporary societies present elements of decomposition and a total evanescence of values. Some coffee. The ruling classes perceive and interpreted the biblical saying, quote, some who are last will be first, end quote, as, quote, those who are the most insignificant, narcissist and depraved will be first and will rule, end quote. This perverted adage was, has been applied by capital and the market mechanism to any aspect of modern society, politics, media, the arts, culture, and education. At the political level, insignificancy, cynicism, social and political apathy or corruption and bureaucracy were coupled with the people's movement toward privatization. As Castoriadis put it, politics has become, quote, practically indistinguishable from any other form of advertising or sale of products, end quote. Concurrently, the political crisis was deepened by the interrogation excuse me, the integration into the system of the so-called left parties, which became entirely systematized and institutionalized. Liberal oligarch, quote, liberal oligarchies, end quote, as Castoriadis named the modern societies, in particular after the collapse of the left ideologies, are experiencing a, quote, ideological aberration, end quote, which is, quote, itself an important sign of the crisis. There is no new subversive or revolutionary discourse but there is no conservative discourse either, end quote. From Castoriadis's point of view, both left-wing and right-wing political parties and their respective programs and ideologies have been deeply immersed in the ideas of, quote, development, quote, economy, quote, rationality, and, quote, progress. Acting as a critical conceptual backdrop against which the ongoing economic crisis could be examined, Castoriadis's approach could also be read as a substantial critique of the thoughts, plans, and policies that have dominated left discourse over the last century, and they are still alive. Modern societies, even under the prism of the current financial crisis or after the numerous instances of environmental destruction, such as the nuclear, quote, accidents of Chernobyl and Fukushima, never pose themselves the fundamental question, what is development? Why development? Development of what and towards what, end quote. Oh, there's no quote there. Sorry. Just a footnote. Um, or not footnote number, but end note number. Castoriadis conceived of the notion of development as, quote, social imaginary signification, end quote, as being in close affinity with the glorification of one. This is a quote with the glorification of, quote, one, 
the virtual, quote, omnipotence, end quote, of technique. Two, the, quote, asymptotic illusion, end quote, relating to scientific knowledge. Three, the, quote, rationality of economic mechanisms. And four, various assumptions about humanity and society, which have changed with the time, excuse me, which have changed with time, but which all imply either that humanity and society are, quote, naturally, end quote, predestined to progress, growth, etc., homo econom economicus, the, quote, invisible hand, liberalism, and the virtues of free competition, end quote, Castoriadis. Following Castoriadis' reasoning, the unlimited expansion of economic rationality and the new religion of, quote, techno-sciences, end quote, are unable to conceal the crisis of development. This crisis, which for Castoriadis is also a crisis of technique, science's rationality and the ideas relating to the self-regulative self ability and power of the free markets, is due to the, quote, struggle which those living under the system carry on against the system, end quote. It is manifested in their increasing reluctance to identify and associate themselves with the dominant imaginary significations of capitalist society. Section 4. Towards a Radical Social Transformation, Socialism, Autonomy, and Revolution. Castoriadis' discussion of the deep-seated crisis of modern capitalist societies is not an abstract, purely academic, and apolitical description of an acute social phenomenon. His view in respect of the role of the scholar in times of a generalized decomposition of Western societies manages to conceptualize well the vantage point from which he dealt with the issue of crisis, quote, uncompromising criticism of existing realities and elucidation of the possibilities for transforming them, end quote. In Castoriadis' approach, then, crisis and critique are dialectically interwoven, and from his perspective, quote, the crisis of criticism is only one of the manifestations of the general and deep-seated crisis of society, end quote. The understanding of the crisis critique relationship is crucial in order to grapple with Castoriadis' analysis of crisis and the alternatives that he put forward to overcome it. He is concerned about showing that since 1950, quote, the Western world has entered into crisis, and this crisis consists precisely in this, that the West ceases to call itself truly into question, end quote. One of the reasons for this lack of self-reflection and self-criticism lies in the fact that, quote, society can open itself onto its own question only if and through this question it still affirms itself as society, end quote. What emerges in Castoriadis' thought is an insightful argument that sheds light on the inadequacy of the left to offer a persuasive alternative to crisis and simultaneously to address two significant issues. The first concerns, quote, society as such, end quote, its own self-presentation and its positing as a meaning and question. Quote, does contemporary man want the society in which he lives? Does he want another one? Does he want society in general, end quote. This questioning process and the search for another society cannot be developed and advanced without an assertive reference not to a fixed and ideal society, but to an alternative project that, quote, does, does say something about that towards which we are heading, end quote. What the Western world is missing, in other words, is neither an improved version of the capitalist social and political model, nor a more efficient regulation of the capitalist economy, but a new undertaking that offers a radical alternative to capitalism. In this sense, modern society is in crisis, according to Castoriadis, because it, quote, is not capable of engendering another way for people to be together, end quote. An ambiguity is found in some other parts of Castoriadis' work in relation to his perception of the issue of crisis. In his essay, quote, The Crisis of Culture in the State, 
end quote. For instance, he made a slightly different point and argued that, quote, there is a crisis when a process has reached a point where, implicitly or potentially, a moment of decision arises between opposing alternatives, end quote. However, if there is not an existing tangible or even potential alternative, how can we make the claim that we are living in a state of crisis in which a decision has to be made between two diametrically opposed versions? At times, Castoriadis categorically asserts that, quote, we are not living today a crisis in the true sense of the term, namely a moment of decision. In the Hippocratic writings, the crisis point in an illness, the crisis, is the paroxysmal moment at the end of which the sick patient either will die or by a salutary reaction provoked by the crisis itself will initiate a process of healing. We are living a phase of decomposition. In a crisis, there are opposing elements that combat each other, whereas what is characteristic of contemporary society is precisely the disappearance of social and political conflict. End quote. It seems that Castoriadis oscillates between his position that contemporary society is th going through a deep-rooted multidimensional crisis and his opinion that it is experiencing a prolonged period of decay and dilapidation since there is no real positive political project that points to a different orientation. It might be the case that what that he believes that the ongoing and long-lasting crisis has led to an impasse which has all the characteristics of decadence and decomposition. Although Castoriadis maintained that we, quote, cannot say that Western societies are dead, simply writing them off from history. When he went so far as to declare that, quote, just as creation is not, quote, explicable, end quote, neither is decadence or destruction. End quote. He resorts to his position concerning the decline of contemporary societies by combining in his analysis both his previous approaches, that is, crisis as inherent to capitalism, resulting from the process of reification and the continuous struggle against it, and crisis as a phenomenon ensuing from the eclipse of the project of autonomy. The interplay of these two explanations forms the basis that allows him to intermingle his theories of crisis with his references to the rise of insignificance and the generalized and pervasive corrosion of values, morals, and social relations. Nonetheless, in many instances throughout his theoretical and political trajectory, Castoriadis determinedly argued that if there is a way out of this permanent crisis of modern society, quote, if there is a response, it is the great majority of people who will provide it, end quote. In his early elaborations, which consider the innate contradictions of capitalism as being responsible for the generation of crisis, Castoriadis made it explicit that these contradictions, and by extension the phenomenon of recurring crisis, quote, cannot be suppressed unless the system itself is abolished, end quote. And it is only class struggle that, quote, can give the contradictions and crises of modern society a revolutionary character, end quote. It is this standpoint that enables Castoriadis to state without hesitation that the crisis cannot be transcended by, quote, carrying out reforms, by raising the standard of living, or by eliminating private property and the, quote, market, end quote. It will be abolished only by the instauration of the workers' collective management over both production and society as a whole, end quote. Equally, on many occasions in his later writings, he maintains his subversive perspective and stands for a radical social transformation as an antidote to the crisis and decline of modern society. The issue at stake, then, is to, quote, comprehend what in the social historical world is dying how and if possible, why, end quote. And in a parallel way to, quote, find in it what perhaps is in the process of being born, end quote. The aim of what Castoriadis calls, quote, revolutionary politics, end quote, is then to trace the, quote, seeds of something new, end quote, that comes out of the crisis and assists with its entire emergence and further development. 
As Castoriadis very characteristically put it, quote, the new will not complete itself, and it will not be able to establish itself as a new social system, as a new pattern of social life, unless at some stage it becomes a conscious activity, a conscious action of the mass of the people, end quote. From Castoriadis' groundbreaking analysis of the content of socialism to his project of autonomy, the objective of, quote, revolutionary politics, end quote, has been the profound reorganization of social institutions and relations, the creation of a new society that aims at, quote, the development of human beings instead of the development of gadgets, end quote. Quote, revolutionary politics, end quote, perceives crisis as, quote, a moment of opportunity or of necessity for acting, end quote. Hence, in order to transcend the permanent crisis of capitalism and create a radical alternative, economic values have to cease to be central in our lives and other significations and objectives must be put at the center of human life. This procedure would amount to a radical reorganization of social institutions and labor, economic, political, and cultural relations. It would also involve a reorientation of Western humanism, changing the conceptions that contemporary societies have regarding the issues of progress, power, knowledge, and nature, and of the relations between them. In pursuing this end, as Castoriadis argued, quote, no critique, not even an analysis of the crisis of capitalism is possible outside of a socialist perspective, end quote. The radical practical activity of those who live from the sale of their labor power then must address and answer the, quote, true problems, end quote. Quote, why produce and why work? What kind of production and what kind of work? What kinds of relations between people should there be? And what kind of orientation for society as a whole? End quote. These, quote, true problems, end quote, allowed Castoriadis to deploy his radical views by epitomizing some of the most critical and revolutionary inspirations of the tradition of the anti-capitalist movement. In Castoriadis' approach, a, quote, positive conception of the content of socialism, end quote, stands for, quote, the restitution of people's domination over their own lives. The transformation of work from an absurd form of breadwinning into the free develop deployment of creative forces of individuals and groups, the constitution of integrated human communities, the unification of people's culture and lives. The socialist program ought to be a program for the humanization of work and society. It ought to be shouted from the rooftops that socialism is not a backyard of leisure attached to the industrial prison or transistors for the prisoners. It is the destruction of the industrial prison itself, end quote. Castoriadis. Socialism as the, quote, destruction of the industrial prison itself, end quote, does not stand for just economic demands and an improvement in the standard of living or for central planning. and the nationalization of industry and economy. Socialism stands for a society that places emphasis on self-expression and self-creation and, quote, aims at giving a meaning to people's life and work, end quote. Marcuse expressed views similar to those of Castoriadis pertaining to the, quote, socialized means of production, end quote. Quote, if these are not utilized for the development and gratification of the free individual, they will amount simply to a new form of subjugation, excuse me, new form of subjugating individuals to a hypostatized universality. The abolition of private property inaugurates an essentially new social system only if free individuals and not, quote, the society, end quote, become masters of the socialized means of production, end quote. Castoriadis. Socialism refers to a fundamental transformation of labor and it is based upon the workers' management of production that is the power of the workers' councils, the radical transformation of all institutions, and the creation of new forms of direct democracy. In Castoriadis' view, socialist society means people's self-organization and for this reason it depends on the autonomous action of the working class.
In this sense, socialism is the self-organization of this autonomy, and by extension, quote, socialism both presupposes this autonomy and helps to develop it, end quote. Although Castoriadis makes a strong case against the use of the term, quote, socialism, end quote, the project of, projects of socialism and autonomy must be seen as being intimately linked to and mediated with each other in and through the process of revolution. In distinction to apolitical interpretations of Castoriadis's works and paraphrasing Luxembourg's dictum regarding the relationship between socialism and democracy for radical critical theory, there is no socialism without autonomy and no autonomy without socialism. Quote, Revolutionary politics, end quote, stand, understands that socialism, autonomy, and revolution are inseparable and sees each as the condition of the other. Castoriadis made it clear that for historical and political reasons, quote, what was intended by the term, quote, socialist society, end quote, we henceforth call autonomous society, end quote. Castoriadis himself was well aware of the fact that the idolatry of, the wor of words cloaks economic and political reality and mystifies the contradictory character of capitalist relations. For him, the deeper meaning of capitalism and its own inherent crises cannot be elucidated, quote, unless one begins with the most total idea of socialism. Socialism is autonomy, people's conscious direction of their lives, end quote. Seen from this perspective, the project of autonomy amounts to a critique and a thoroughgoing shake-up of all established forms of social life, and it is critical of any form of exploitation and domination. Autonomy implies a constant, quote, calling into question, end quote, a, quote, unending interrogation, end quote, which by no means is the privilege of an isolated individual, a small group of people, or a semi-religious sect of anarchist, Marxist, autonomist, or Castoriadians. <laughs> Determinate negation and radical opposition to capitalism, which does not express, as James Burnham put it, quote, genuine social forces are as trivial in relation to entrenched power as the old court jesters, end quote. As Castoriadis, excuse me, as Castoriadis phrased it, the radical project of autonomy is to always go, quote, hand in hand with a movement on the part of society, that is critical toward the established order, the powers that be, and the dominant ideas, end quote. In this sense, it could contribute enormously to the creation of what Marx and Engels called the, quote, proletarian movement, end quote, which is, quote, the self-conscious independent movement of the immense majority in the interest of the immense majority, end quote and which will rely, quote, solely and exclusively upon the intellectual development of the working class as it necessarily had to ensure from united action and discussion, end quote. It will be a self-conscious, independent, and radical movement that, go that includes the conception of autonomy and at the same time goes beyond the conception of autonomy, a self-organized movement that calls everything into question and keeps the question open, and most importantly, an emancipatory movement that which, quote, cherishes the questions themselves, end quote, quote, lives the questions, end quote, lives everything. The project of autonomy is not a complete and closed theoretical system which substitutes the absolute truths of the traditional labor movement with a dogmatic and apolitical adherence to Castoriadis's tenets. It is not an infallible dogma which consists of a rigid and doctrinaire set of principles. It cannot be separated from social reality as an abstract model having a fixed and general application. As Luxembourg put it succinctly and in an anti-dogmatic manner, end quote, excuse me, as Luxembourg put it succinctly and in an anti-dogmatic manner, quote, we have never been idol worshippers of formal democracy, nor have we ever been idol worshippers of socialism or Marxism either, end quote. Needless to say, this applies equally to Castoriadis' thinking and the idea of autonomy. The project of autonomy is not a logical inference from Castoriadis' correct theory. 
It is not imposed upon the radical movement as a predetermined theoretical scheme. Neither is it derived from a scholastic interpretation of Castoriadis, nor is it reduced to, quote, Talmudic commentary on sacred texts, end quote. Castoriadis himself stresses that, quote, autonomy is not closure, but rather opening, end quote. It is not a state, and it does not constitute another more sophisticated academic dogma which represents the only genuine version of emancipatory politics. It is rather a process, a critical practical activity of becoming autonomous, both individually and socially, by rejecting capitalist social relations. In this respect, it is a process of both critical thinking and radical praxis. Since the disarticulation between theory and practice belongs to the reified world that wants to transcend, Sorry. I think there might be a typo here. Maybe I'm, I'm making a typo in my brain. In this respect, it is a process of both critical thinking and radical praxis. Since the disarticulation between theory and practice belongs to the reified world that it wants to transcend. Autonomy entails a procedure of political education and ongoing penetrating criticism of capitalist relations in and through the course of political and social struggles for human emancipation. Autonomy promotes the self-activity of the people and reflects upon the dialectic of form and content of political organization, posing the question as regards the means and relation. It argues that an autonomous society has already to be anticipated in the form of organization deployed in an emancipatory movement. In doing this, it rejects professional politicians and the party form, and it seeks to transcend in practice the pre-existing divisions within the labor movement between rulers and the ruled, the directors and the performers. Autonomy conceives the traditional hierarchical structures of the radical movement as transitory forms of organization in the process of being changed by human activity. In contradistinction to crystallized and sclerotic forms of organization, it maintains that open assemblies, councils and communes, in terms of their form and content, unite elements of self-discipline and freedom, or self-limitation and freedom, to use Castoriadis' terms, and also overcome the division between representatives and represented. Autonomy challenges the dogmatic and left conformist adherence to parliamentarism, negating capitalist state, representative democracy, and professional politicians. As Castoriadis put it, quote, to decide means to decide for oneself, to decide who is to decide already in not, in not deciding for oneself. As Castor has put it, quote, to decide means to decide for oneself. To decide who is to decide already is not quite deciding for oneself. The only total form of democracy is therefore direct democracy, end quote. The later Castoriadis is equally assertive, quote, in my view, there is no democracy but direct democracy. A representative democracy is not a democracy, end quote. Direct democracy is of key importance to the expansion and deepening of political education that fosters the creation of an autonomous society. It contributes enormously to the political politicization of social, economic, political, and cultural relations. Direct democracy involves a radical critique of the inverted forms of capitalist social relations and is open to the process of struggle itself. <laughs> It concerns not only the political sphere, but both production and society as a whole. For Castoriadis, a, quote, purely political autonomy would be meaningless, end quote. The idea of autonomy as self-determination and self-organization of the people does not pertain to an abstract and indeterminate form of the economy. Castoriadis refers to capitalist economy and argues that, quote, autonomy is therefore meaningless unless autonomy implies workers' management. That is, unless it involves organized workers determining the production process themselves at the level of the shop, the plant, entire industries, and the economy as a whole, end quote. 
To this end, the revolutionary project, as Castoriadis called it, quote, is not an end, end quote, but a beginning, a quote, beginning, end quote. And autonomy can be grasped, quote, only as a social problem and as a social relation, end quote. As a political and social problem, autonomy does not merely amount to an abstract renunciation of any form of heteronomy and determinism that leads to an uncritical acceptance of Castoriadis' dismissal of Marx, critical Marxism, or any other strand of the radical anti-capitalist tradition. Rather, it must trace its own beginning in Castoriadis' argument when, in line with Marx, he pointed out that the transcendence of alienation and subsequently of the permanent crisis of capitalism calls for, quote, the necessity of abolishing classes, end quote, advances the, quote, idea of the transformation of institutions, end quote, and, quote, all this both presupposes and leads to a radical change in the mode of existence of human beings, individually and collectively, end quote. Nor does the in proje project of autonomy as a social relation involve a fashionable invocation of the concepts of, quote, imaginary, end quote, and, quote, creativity, which is which takes the place of the grasping and penetrating critique and analysis of social, economic, and political capitalist relations. As Psychodetus noted, I think it might be Psychopetus, if it's the guy who's like affiliated with Open Marxism, I think it's Psychopetus, but um, I just assume that he's not talking about that. So the text says, as Psychodetus noted, quote, the root of revolutionary subjectivity cannot lie in some creativity divorced from the presuppositions and achievements of social practice as it stems from the system of division of labor and of political slash class relations, nor can these presuppositions and results be analyzed as creation ex nihilo by taking the, quote, creative and, quote, element in action as a starting point. They must be analyzed as social relations within which human creativity is shaped historically under alienating and exploitative forms. The, quote, creative element in human action becomes abstract and ideological if it is separated from that relation and given precedence over it so as to provide a foundation for it, end quote. Castoriadis. The construction of fetishistic concepts and an unquestioning endorsement of the priority of the notions of imaginary creation and institutions cannot, can only, excuse me, not only abstract from particular social relations, but have also led Castoriadis's critical theory to become domesticated, bloodless, and apolitical. This approach postulates the primacy of a purely contemplative grip of Castoriadis's theorizing, thus downplaying his oppositional and revolutionary sense. As a consequence, his theory ceases to be grasped as social critique, and he is construed in a conformist manner, which has resulted in, quote, the adoration of what is, the sanctification of the fate accompli, a fetishistic attitude toward, quote, reality, end quote, end quote. In this way, society is conceived as being non-contradictory, the social relations of production are taken for granted, and the practical and social constitution of abstract and ideological categories is never questioned. Determinism seems to enter by the back door since institutions appear to subsist as independent entities, having their own logic separately from disparate social contradictions. Historical Tendencies in Human Relations Castoriadis' conceptual tools are disconnected from social relations and political action, and hence radical praxis and his revolutionary project drop out of sight. Such an approach implies a canonization of Castoriadis' thought and marks a departure from the most radical aspects of his critical theory. In many instances in his writing, however, he insisted on not compromising himself with the capitalist reality. He refused to make concessions, to, quote, make reality into a virtue and to conclude that something is right just because it, because it is a fact, end quote. He articulates his revolutionary project as a life endeavor to unite the various individual and collective revolts against the system to radically reconstruct society 
and transform the crisis of capitalism into a revolutionary crisis. Honnett, Axel Honnett, focuses on this point succinctly when he argues that, quote, Castoriadis has detached himself from the theoretical framework of Marxism in order to be able to rescue for the present Marxism's practical core, the idea of a revolutionary transformation of capitalism, end quote. Castoriadis makes an effort to conceptualize the relationship between crisis and revolution and to articulate the relationship between his theory of crisis and radical theory. This in turn implies his deploying of a concept of revolution which has nothing to do with an inevitable bloodletting of a neurotic expectation of a, quote, great action, end quote. For Castoriadis, revolution is a prolonged historical and social process that means self-organization of the people. The idea of revolution as self-institution of society in and through the democracy of the councils runs through his theoretical and political analysis from Russia 1917 to Hungary 1956 to France 1968. For Castoriadis, revolution is always in fluid movement and becomes aware of its essence in the course of the class struggle itself. It is an unending process, an unlimited interrogation, and an open question. Castoriadis's revolutionary project regains its radical and critical force in and through its contribution to the public time and space horizon of the anti-capitalist struggles. Its questioning, vigor, it, its questioning vigor provokes the other currents of the anti-capitalist tradition, and at the same time it is challenged by them, coexisting and working together in the direction of the radical transformation of capitalism. Revolution means that, quote, most of the community enters a phase of political meaning instituting activity, end quote. A revolutionary period of struggle begins, according to Castoriadis, when people form their own autonomous organs. With their autonomous collective activity, they open their way forward, becoming conscious of the fact that revolution as a radical alternative to the crisis of modern societies, quote, is not a matter of living one night of love, it is a matter of living a whole life of love, end quote. End of chapter 5.